All right. All righty, folks. So today we're picking up where we uh, left off. And um, talking about uh, life as we know it, as they like to say. Um, we were talking about photosynthesis. We were talking about cellular respiration. Remember all that wonderful stuff? And uh, that is what we'll come to tell you at some point is the basis for the uh, food chain, right? And again, you probably knew that already. Uh, the sun grows the green plants. The... Uh, the uh, herbivores, okay, the grazers, eat the green plants. Something that uh, has a fondness for meat eats the uh, grazers, and so on and so forth. You got some omnivores thrown in there for good measure. Mix it up with your carnivores and your herbivores. But uh, that's that's the system of life as, as you've come to uh, recognize it. When an herbivore eats plants, carnivores need the omnivores for it, right? Yes, sir. Yep. Omnivore eats all. Carne is meat and herby is, is plants, exactly. But believe it or not, that's not the only food chain on the planet. Uh, it's just, I, I want to say, I don't even want to say the most common because. Yikes, the more we learn about the other one, the more we, uh, well, the more we learn. So that's solar-based life, all right? Um, all energy, uh, all life at the surface of the Earth is possible due to photosynthesizing organisms. In one of my other classes, in my geology class, I just uh, finished talking about um, the origin of life on the planet and how the first life was... Um, Cyanobacteria, blue-green bacteria, you may have heard of them. Yeah, it was cool that, you know, somebody had to be first life, but what was really great about them was that the, the green part of the blue-green, they contain chlorophyll, and they eventually oxygenated um, the planet for us. So, anywho, um, that, that started the whole food chain, if you would. So energy flow is, uh, remember this chapter is all about energy flow. So while we're talking about um, bunnies and wolves and all that stuff surreptitiously in the, in the background there, um, it's, it's really about energy flow. Started with the sun, went into the plant, transferred into the bunny, transferred into the, 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 the I almost said the deer, deers don't eat bunnies, but um, I was trying to transfer it into humans, you know. So I'll be like, and then the humans eat the deer, but it doesn't work that way. Yeah, we don't need wolves, at least anymore. So, but you get the idea. Um, it's also, you may have heard food chain before, it's called a food web now, okay? Because a chain is way too simple. Again, you probably learned that in fifth grade, not third grade. Um, I think I learned about it There you go, thank you. Um, so organisms convert the sun's energy into sugars and other organisms eat them, so on and so forth. Not gonna reiterate everything we just did, but that's summarizing it. There is, however, something called chemosynthesis. All right? And chemosynthesis is really freaking cool. Uh, instead of photo, which was light, this is chemochemical, chemical synthesis. So this is non-solar based energy transfer. Hmm? Isn't that what on the No, well, no, not in this case at any rate. Um, so what we're going to talk about here is uh, we have to go all the way down to the bottom of the ocean, to the deepest parts of the bottom of the ocean, um, where the sunlight just doesn't have any chance of reaching. Any ocean? And um, several of them. Um, and, what? Well, there are only like four oceans. I think Pacific, Indian, Ocean. Yep. So we go deep down to the to the ocean floor uh, that we were only fairly recently uh, able to get to, and um, they were amazed when they found not just life down there, but uh, a, a very complex ecosystem. And it was all around these things called deep sea vents or black smokers. You may have heard of that, all right, and. Um, the basis of the food chain to sort of cut to the chase uh, there um, were bacteria who eat sulfur that was coming out of these 
black smokers. And then something ate the bacteria and so on and so forth. So that H2S is, is hydrogen sulfide, and um, it's mentioned in the second bullet there. And the primary producers is the word that I that jumped out of my head a moment ago. So the bacteria are the primary producers down there. Um, up on the uh, surface of the earth again, it was the, uh, the green plants, right? So the, the uh, primary producers started a food web. Um, the bacteria, now that word extremophiles, all right. Uh, the Mountain Dew guys aren't around anymore, but I used to joke that it's not like the Mountain Dew guys. Uh, they're even more extreme. Uh, and even more extreme than that Red Bull guy that jumped out of the stratosphere a few years back. Okay. Uh, these guys live inside of volcanoes. They live mile down in, in ice. And they, they manage to live in those environments. And these extremophiles are very important when we start studying um, origins and life on other planets. Okay, because again, that life as we know it, it's sort of a running joke with, uh, you know, scientists who talk about that kind of stuff. And in sci-fi, space movies have, have said it so many times too. It, it, it loses its effect. But what we really talk about it is life as we know it. And then when we find on our very own planet something that is now life as we, another way that we can know life, um, that's really huge find, really huge find. So here's just a, a actually a really bad picture, but if you take into account the fact that it's through a submarine window uh, and or at least you know several miles down on the ocean floor, it's not a horrible picture, really. Uh, you see some smokers there in the background off to the right. Uh, there are these blackish gray tubes. Um, and coming out of them is that, that really hot water. It's not smoke. Um, but it is uh, water that has a lot of dissolved iron and sulfur and a handful of other ingredients in them. Uh, those tubes are formed um, because that really hot water has, as I just indicated, a, a plenty of minerals in them. Uh, when it hits that cold water, some of them instantly um, come out of solution. They, they precipitate. Borrow a word from chem class there. So these are the sun for lack of a better word, down there. And off to the side, um, there's a handful of things, but the easiest thing to see are these white and, and red things, and those are tube worms, all right? Not like that nasty thing in Dune, but um, these, are, these are definitely freaky on their own right. Um, these guys are filter feeders, all right? A lot like we have filter feeders in the normal parts of the ocean. Um, they absorb, and I shouldn't call them filter feeders, because they actually absorb um, a lot of uh, their material as well. But crawling in and around these guys, much like uh, a coral reef that you're very familiar with, there is, is many other organisms, and, I, and I'm pretty sure I have some pictures in here. So this is called a chemosynthetic ecosystem, okay? Photosynthetic being the, the normal, for lack of a better word, kind. And this is quite likely uh, one of the first ecosystems we had on the, our planet, uh, because it was not as hospitable back then uh, as it is today. And again, potentially when we talk about other planets and you know we're trying to rule out life or the potential for life, um, we now have to consider factors like these. Some more black smokers. There's a slightly better version of the tube worms. Again, the white part is the uh, the tube they could go down into and pop back out of, uh, kind of like uh, if you're familiar with uh, critters that live in coral, um, they could pop in and out of their little coral. It's just the condominiums. I don't know if you guys know that. It's an apartment building. Uh, if you've got a piece of coral at home, uh, take a look at it later. There's little tiny uh, circles on it, and if it's really well preserved, uh, you're going to see a little what looks like asterisk or snowflakey kind of top to us, and um, each one of those was home to a, uh, a coralite, a critter, um, and they would come in and out of there to to filter feed, and little tentacles and everything. Very cool, very cool. But we see coral and think, you know, how is that an animal? Well, it's not. It's their communal seashell, if you would. 
So anyhow, these are their uh, seashells, and the tube worms can come in and out of there. And like I said, there's this really weird thing going on. They, they do a bit of filter feeding, but I also think they absorb um, a lot of their uh, nutrients through those uh, funky ruby bodies of theirs. Riftia pachyptala. And encrusting them are other critters. Again, very similar to if you've, you've wandered off of a beach area um, or well-groomed beach at a hotel or something, you've got to go to a natural beach, you'll start to find uh, critters encrusted all over everything. Again, let alone on a, on a coral reef. And you see the water behind there is teeming with little sea monkey type critters. And all this is, again, just, just leagues below the surface, never seen the light of day. Um, just an amazing find when they, they stumbled upon it. Uh, we got to a point where we could build our little yellow submarines and go exploring where folks never had gone before. And um, they were quite surprised. Quite surprised. Uh, there's some crabs. You can see the crabs in the foreground in this picture. And that's what was really weird. It's not just these tube worms that we don't have at the surface, but stuff that we have that we've come to know and love that can exist down there. And if you remember me talking, um, actually, I don't think I talked about it in here too much, um, how much things change pressure-wise uh, in the atmosphere and so on and so forth when we go up uh, or when you go down into the ocean. Okay, there's a lot of pressure down there. That's why, you know, you have to pressurize airplanes or pressurize submarines or suits, you know, your, your, your deep sea diving suits. Um, you have to make an internal pressure that's equal to the external pressure or you will collapse or explode accordingly. Um, so these guys obviously managed to, to develop that uh, over the years. Uh, and the crazy thing was, is, you know, we wanted to bring back samples so these poor things are used to living under such extreme pressure. When you bring them back up to the surface, they don't do so well. All right. So that was just a little bit of a taste of what's going on there. Um, and in talking about that and in comparing the two environments, we, we, we started to touch on some words that you, you've heard before. We, we use the carnivore, the herbivore, the omnivore thing. Um, we're going to modify that a little bit now and uh, generalize it, really, and talk about producers, consumers, and, and decomposers. Excuse me. But in the context of environmental science, in the context of ecology, they use a special word. They call trophic levels. Okay, You've probably not come across that word before. Maybe you have. Um, and again, that's the words we use when we're talking about energy, all right? Because it is, is unpretty or fancy or whatever you want to say as it is, that that's really all eating is about. You arguably could get everything you need from some scientifically made nutrient bar, and we would, you know, live normal, happy lives. We wouldn't be fat. We wouldn't be super skinny. We would just all be normal human-sized peoples. But no, we've taken eating to a whole new wonderful level, right? Uh, especially if you're a foodie and you enjoy all those things. Um, we have so many different types of food out there and, and so on and so forth. We lose that idea that it really is just about gaining enough energy to exist. Not, not that I mind drinking, mind you, but, um, but that really is what it's about. So producers, what do you think they do with regard to this whole conversation? Hmm? They produce stuff. Yeah, they produce um, probably the basis of the food uh, chain or the food web. They produce energy. Well, they make energy accessible. All right. They make energy accessible. Be it the sun. You can't eat the sun, right? So they don't eat the sun, um, but they make the sun's energy usable. Um 
going to say you can't eat the sulfur down at these these deep sea vents, but obviously something does. Um, so, but most folks can't, right? So these these um, these bacteria, they uh, turn the sulfur into something that other things can eat. So that's what's going on at the producer level. The consumer obviously consumes, right? Um, and uh, again, there's levels to that. We talked about, um, and this is where herbivore, carnivore, and omnivore come in, actually, um, because those are three types of consumerism, if you would. Allow me to conjugate as such. Um, decomposers. What do they have to do with this whole mix? Yeah. So there's only so much even a good carnivore is going to eat, right? Think about the last time you had wings, if you eat chicken wings, or the last time you had anything, whatever. But chicken wings are a great example, because unless you're really serious or really hungry, uh, you're only going to gnaw so far onto those chicken bones. You're going to toss it off to the side. I got more wings, I don't even gnaw on that. Well, there's still energy there. Now, I'm not even talking about eating the bones, right? There's just those bits of tendon and whatever. Out there in the real world, it's not just people eating chicken wings. It's it's wolves taking down deer. And uh, yes, they're very hungry. And yes, they're going to eat as much as they can, and someone else is going to come along, and someone else is going to come along. But again, there's waste. And it's not just all about carnivores either. There's, there's plants. Okay, Plant falls down in the woods. Well, it's time for it to start a whole new level of its life. It may or may not be cognizant of it. it may or not have been cognizant of its previous life, but once it arguably dies, right, the bugs move in, so on and so forth. Yes, sir? Are, are fungi and vultures the same category? Uh, uh, sort of. No, but sort of. They're close. They fulfill sort of the same purpose. Vulture comes under scavenger, and we will have all this stuff eventually um, officially given to you. But, um, but yeah, no, vulture falls under sort of a scavenger. Uh, a fungus is, is more of a decomposer, for sure. So the decomposers come in on what's left, and they manage to fulfill uh, uh, sort of the last niche there where the, the undesirables are still, uh, we can extract some energy from them. And then oftentimes those decomposers get eaten by other organisms, transferring that energy yet again. So ecosystems typically contain all three types of energy users, all three trophic levels. And um, I'm, I'm going to anthropomorphize, I know they say that word, anthropomorphize this, this, this a little bit. And that, that's a nice, happy ecosystem when you have all of those working together, okay? Um, all three trophic levels fully operating, one not out of control of the other. Um, some of you who uh, watch TV and also listen to the news, uh, may start to get worried. You hear there's a lot of uh, fungus uh, that is growing more so than ever before. Um, and not just, uh, you know, like the Last of Us kind of fungus, but um, but some of it's pretty scary. And, and, you know, working in parks and, again, with uh, climate change, it's able to grow in areas that it never could grow before. Um, we're not to the worrying about it levels yet, all right? But... Um, but again, we see these these things, these levels rise and, and, and decline. Ideally, you want to have a nice balance, which arguably can differ depending on the ecosystem. But you want to have a nice balance of all three of these guys. The most important, well, what is, you guys tell me. What is the most important, arguably, of the, these three levels? Yeah, producers, right? Because if there's nobody out there making the food, then everyone else, that, that food web's going to fall right apart. And again, that's something that, that ties in very specifically to this class. When we start talking about pollution and, and, and changing environments and stuff like that, we always think about the big, furry, cute things. But you can seriously mess stuff up and throw your producers out of balance. All right? uh, back in the days when I was growing up, we still had... Uh, I don't want to say we don't have nuclear war to worry about, but we had a lot more to worry about about nuclear war back then, arguably. Um, and the big big thing hanging over the, the head of that was a nuclear winter. Right? Anyone remember what nuclear, or know what nuclear winter would be? 
<laughs> Maybe you guys didn't grow up with that stuff. Um, but it's still out there, and it's in video games and movies and all that crap. Um, the idea was that um, the, the nuclear explosions would throw enough um, dust and whatnot into the atmosphere that it would uh, basically filter out a good bit of the sun's energy. Uh, temperatures would drop, solar output would drop, uh, and we would basically fall into not just a winter, but a you know several years worth of winter. Um, and that arguably could collapse the food chain, at least in various parts of the world. Um, so, so yeah. And that happens when meteorites and whatnot smash into the Earth as well. Um, it can throw up enough dust into the atmosphere that you go into a cooling period and whatnot. And they've got evidence of that in the, in the rock records. So it's, it's, it is a thing, but hopefully not something we need to worry about. All right, so producers, um, more vocabulary. There's a lot of vocabulary in these guys, and I, and I really urge you to, to spend some time studying for it. So uh, autotroph. Okay, if you remember that, that trope is energy, right? Uh, auto, you should be aware of that word. Um, so autotrophs can self-nourish. Autobiography, if you're writing a book about yourself, right? Um, auto, well, there's a handful of other ones we won't define, but, um, so self-nourishment, um, you're able to convert inorganic substances into organic compounds. You're able to make energy. And again, that's really cool. Uh, practically on day one, I told you guys, reminded you guys about, um, not just chlorophyll, but mitochondria. Okay. Those are the two basic in your plant and your animal cells. Those are the two basic um, organelles that are able to do this. They could exist on their own. They don't typically that we see. Uh, so those are in uh, organisms that we call the autotrophs. Uh, unfortunately for them, again, whether they're aware of it or not, you know, we will never know. Uh, they are the primary source of energy for other organisms. On land, these are the plants, the autotrophs on land. And, and again, you could just see this rolling out as a multiple guess question, right? On land, what are the primary producers? Circle the correct answer. On the oceans, all right, we look towards the algae and the bacteria. Yes, of course, there are plants in the ocean, but by far, these guys outnumber, um, outnumber them. And yes, there's algae and bacteria on the surface, but as far as energy goes, the uh, plants uh, outproduce them on land. So autotrophs, these are the producers. Hetero, other, other energy, or different nourishment. Uh, they eat producers, or sometimes other consumers. I know we talked about, again, a couple words just a few moments ago. Carnivore, herbivore, omnivore, we're still kind of tapping around that. But now we're going to mention primary consumer, secondary consumer, tertiary consumer. So primary, you got your herbivores. Those are the guys who directly eat the autotrophs we just talked about, the producers. Then you have the secondary consumers. They eat the primary consumers. Typically, those are the carnivores. All right. Typically, those are the carnivores. Yes, you could weave some story wherein someone's uh, sole source of nourishment is a mushroom. Okay. And therefore, we have a, a fungivore eating a, a uh, decomposer and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, we're talking, you know, 98% of things, not that weird little 1%. Okay. So typically, these are your carnivores. 
And then your tertiary consumers, those are the ones that eat the secondary consumers. Why did we just go black? Okay, it's bad. Um, and yeah, they probably have quaternary and so on and so forth. Again, out in the wilds, you know, these food webs are very, very complex. Can be, at any rate. Because arguably, even at this level, again, I'm trying to simplify things to teach you here. But yes, arguably, you know, you, you could eat uh, meat and vegetable. We, we call that the omnivore. So, and here they are. So the omnivore it eats producers and consumers. I'm not arguing against vegetarianism. You guys that happen to do that, more power to you. Um, but the surefire way, and this is from my paleontology background, when we're looking at these old critters and we're telling you that they did this and they lived here and they, you know, you wonder how we did all that stuff. Uh, a lot of it comes from looking at their teeth, especially if, you know, you want to know what they ate. Uh, the teeth are the key to finding out whether you are a carnivore, an herbivore, or an omnivore. Uh, if you've looked at horses or cows, had the opportunity to, uh, you know that they have very different teeth than, say, your cat. Okay? Um, you look at a human, well, we've got the best of both worlds. We've got the grinders and the mashers, and we also have the terrors and the puncturers. Humans are omnivores. That's true. So, yes. Yes, it is. So, um, that's what you're supposed to do. That's what your body's evolved to do. Yes, there were various points in time where we ate only this or only that, but well, we evolved from that. But um, our teeth are evidence of, of the preference for both. And then we have the detritivores. This is the gross stuff we don't like to talk about. Your scavengers, okay. Uh, they eat detritus. That's why we call them a detritivore. Um, decaying organic matter is, is a great definition for detritus. I'm sure your textbook would give you a much more involved one. So these are the guys eating carcasses, um, feces, right? Uh, leaf litter. In other words, all that stuff on the forest floor. I know it's a wonderful thing to walk with your sweetie holding hands through the woods and kicking up leaves, but... Uh, if you ever stop and look down and kick a little deeper, it's quite often some nasty stuff right under your feet. But we need them there. We want them there. Oh, and then we've got insectivores. Let us not forget them. Okay? Critters that just eat bugs. And there's more than just the anteater out there. Birds are one of the great examples, too. That's why woodpeckers peck on wood to get the bugs out. So again, words you're familiar with, we're just kind of putting them, framing them, structuring them into a into a a context for you. Any questions before we keep on plugging along? Because decomposers sounds an awful lot like the last one, right? Well, not the insectivore one, the one before that, the detritivore, all right? But um, decomposers really kick in and take it just as far as it can go, all right? Um, these are called saprotrophs. Rotten nourishment. Sapro is a prefix that comes in around along the lines of meeting rotting or decaying. Dead. I think it's dead. I think it is more in the dead. It's been a long time since I looked that one up. So dead nourishment, dead energy, rotting. So they're breaking down dead organic material and using those components as energy. They're really the last line there, as we said. Um what they don't use up, what did I mean with this one here? What they don't use up or release as waste, 
can be used by producers. I don't know what I was going for there. Huh? So, um, now what they release as waste can be used. I do know that. Um, a lot of times you've got these uh, soil stuff going on in the soil uh, where you've got these, like the nitrogen cycle and so on and so forth. Um, a lot of uh, bacteria release um, gases that are quite useful to other organisms on the planet. But I'm not sure about this. Uh, yeah, I guess that, that would be producers then as well. All right. So, yeah, so then the plants take them up. Uh, it's, one of the, it's like why you have to rotate crops. I don't know if you've ever heard that before, but you can't just continually grow the same crop year after year in a field. Um, they like to throw uh, beans in, legumes in every so often, because I think they add nitrogen back into the soil, really important component. Okay, so you could grow your corn, 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 but at some point you got to throw in a, a crop of green beans, okay, um, or soybeans, more important. We, we use soybeans in so many applications, um, but something about the way that, that legumes grow and more so the bacteria, I think, that attaches themselves to the roots, and I don't even know why I know this other than I teach classes like this every so often, um, they release nitrogen into the soil, all right? So I think that's what I was going for there. And examples of these guys, and we already talked about them a couple minutes ago, but again, here it is in context. Your, your fungus, your mushrooms, okay, and certainly uh, bacteria. It's not the most pleasant thing to drive. Where do you usually see this? Driving along the roads, right? And you see these nasty things. And I think even nastier is, is driving by the, uh, the poor uh, groundhog or whatever it is, um, that's all swollen and bloated up, okay? Um, they're, they're already at work then. When it's just a smeared mess, it's uh, somehow less gross for me at any rate. Sorry, I hope you didn't just eat breakfast. All right, how does all this work? Well, obviously, we've been telling you how it all works, but guess what? They've got more vocabulary words for it. Food chain, like I said, is sort of not exactly outdated, but it's it's way too simplistic. Food chain is how when you want to explain it to a five-year-old kind of thing. You know, the bunny eats the grass, the, the wolf eats the bunny. Keep it simple. Food web is much more realistic, as it says. Um, multiple organisms eat multiple things. That wolf may not just eat bunnies. It might eat birds. It might eat, um, I don't know, groundhogs, whatever. Okay? And, and so on and so forth. So again, we had the word, uh, trophic level. Um, that's an organism's level in this structure. Uh, we already mentioned this already. Okay, we used uh, primary, secondary, and uh, tertiary a couple minutes ago. It's very simple, similar. So first level, first trophic level is the producers. Second trophic level is the primary consumers. Third trophic level is the secondary consumers. So here is much more involved than I usually get. I don't know why I focus on wolves and bunnies. So we've got little mousy here. Little mousy eats. Um, well, I'm sure little mousy would love insects too. But am I blocking you when I sit right here? Because I sit here a lot. No, you're good. Okay. Just throw an eraser at me or something. I'm never in the way. So let's not even start with the mousy. Of course, let's start with the uh, sun. Okay. So this lovely little, um, well, let's say it's millet there. All right, hardly anybody likes millet, so we'll feed it to this little mousy. Um, millet are the teeny tiny little balls in the uh, bag of bird feed that you get. And it's like always, even the birds pick it out and set it aside. I, I think it just falls to the ground, but uh, it grows nice little pretty grass. Do you ever notice that you get different grass underneath your bird feeder? It's not just the bird poop, it's all those seeds. Anywho. So the sun's energy goes into this lovely little millet plant here, 
and uh, Mr. Mouse comes by and eats that millet to uh, have a little salad with his insects that he just finished. Uh, and he's lazy and sleepy because he just had a great big meal and he's not really paying attention on the way home when uh, Mr. Sammy Snake comes by and says, Go! and puts the little mousey in his tummy. Well, we know snakes take a long time to digest things. They don't exactly have a great metabolism. So that's in, because they don't have internal heat and all that stuff. We, that's a whole other conversation now. Um, but uh, so while they're laying out there in the sun trying to digest their meal, uh, Mr. Hawk comes flying overhead and says, Ooh, I haven't had snake in a while. Hell no. And uh, picks up that, uh, that bird, takes him off somewhere, kills him, eats him, and again, tired, fat, and lazy from his great big meal. He's not paying a whole lot of attention. He gets up and walks across the road and smash right into a semi truck. And he falls over to the side of the road where these last guys kick in and do their job and they have a meal. Yeah. yeah. It feeds a lot of feeds a lot of mushrooms while a hawk does. And then again, where does it go from there? Well, that's where this slide ends. But uh, obviously, some things do eat eat um, eat those things. Okay, we kind of start the process over again. Um, the arrows at the bottom here. Okay, you always remember. No, this this ties all the way back to that uh, thermodynamic stuff we were talking about. All right, and the transfer of energy. Um, none of these processes is a hundred percent efficient. Uh, starting, you know, from the very first moment, the, the, the plant is losing energy. The uh, mouse, in order to walk, the, the hawk, in order to fly, that's all energy loss. All right, it's pointing down. That doesn't mean we're losing it to the ground. It just means energy is out of this equation. They could have just as easily put those arrows up, but they have all their other stuff there. So they made these arrows go down. And again, heat is even, you know, sort of subjective here. Um, we, we could use that energy in so many, so many ways. Movement, I think, is the easiest way to understand. Even digestion takes energy. It takes energy to digest the food you ate for energy. And each time we're moving up a trophic level, okay? You see those words again? Producer, primary consumer, secondary consumer, tertiary consumer and decomposes. If that was a bird that we'd like to eat, you know, you could put in a quaternary consumer here and have somebody hunt it and then eat said bird and then throw the bones on the ground for the mushrooms to kick in. So again, a food chain is Super simple. A food web, much more complex. This is a bit insane with arrows, but I think that was their point. We got some trees, we got an owl, and I'm just reading down the side here. I can't even begin to find all these. We could do sort of a Where's Waldo, though, in this very easily. Um, gray squirrel, chipmunk, cottontail, that's a rabbit, I'm guessing. A red fox, a deer, a hawk, a bluebird. Uh, nobody eats bluebirds. Red winged blackbird, blackberry, robin, woodpecker, a lot of birds in here. Red clover, there's some more food. Uh, bacteria and fungi, worms and ants, moths, deer mice, spiders. What do spiders eat? Um, hmm? They eat anything that binds to their web. Uh, oh, good good. Bugs. Which is typically um, bugs. Uh, isn't that what you said a moment ago? Okay. Yeah, it's from here. Yeah. So bugs, insects. We'll go with insects. Um, I was wondering the other day. I don't know. Maybe you guys know. Everything sticks to spiders' webs, right? Um, spiders obviously don't stick to their own webs. I'm wondering if spiders are able to walk on any other spiders' webs, or if they they're immune to it, so to speak, or if it's only if it's like species specific. Do you ever ponder that kind of stuff? Uh, so, anywho, food, <coughs> excuse me, food web, arguably 
I could ask you to stare at something like this and, and, and write out one chain, but uh, I'm not going to do that to you. But do keep in mind some of the conversations we've had over and over and over again, the, the grass bunny, deer, wolf, no, not deer, <laughs> keep throwing the deers eating bunnies in there. Uh, um, grass bunny, wolf uh, is, is a gr very common example. The, uh, the hawk, snake, mouse, grass is a little more complex, but uh, you could see some questions about that. Speaking of which, questions, no. comments, concerns. Yeah. I was actually wrong. I have heard of spiders that um, um, are right there. Um, no, there is. You're right. There is. Yeah, I heard of a big ass that scary that spider, though. The birds while the yeah, that's true. That's true. I forgot about the spider eating spider eating bird. I forget what that is. Even because it's a thing. But, all right. Anything else? All right. So that went a little quicker than I I thought. Um,